District of Copper's Cove. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Indeed, today is the day the Lord has made, and I am so glad to see all of you that are here worshiping with us in person, and I know that there are uh, as many that are also worshiping with us online, and I am glad to welcome all of you to do what we do best together, and that is to worship the Lord our God. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, and it is a good day to begin this season. I call your attention to a few announcements. Um, I want to make sure that you um, not only notice our calendar for the week ahead, but I want to uh, make sure you see that announcement that says, good job, FPC. Great, we donated, all of you, really donated 320 pounds of food last week for the Super Bowl of Caring and a $100 gift card. Yay. Well done. Well done. And that will feed many people, will help out the soup kitchen for very many weeks to come, and certainly spreads Christ's love. Um, and hopefully touches them and lets them know from where that love is coming is through us, but we are servants of that Lord. Um, I would like also um, to call your attention to the congregational meeting that we will be having today. Um, it follows our worship service. Um, it, we have a number of things to accomplish, and we are going to move quickly through the meeting. Um, um, so sort of Buckle your seatbelts and hold on. Um, we're going to receive the 2023 annual report. We're going to be reviewing the New Year's budget. We're going to be electing two of you. So be thinking, if you have not already given this some thought, if whether you would like to be part um, of, of the nominating committee that is starting today for the next year. Um, it's an important position. Um, not a terribly difficult one, but an important one. And we need two congregational members to be elected today. We have one session member who's already been elected, but we'll need two from the floor that will get nominated today. And then we also will be um, electing two elders for filling incomplete terms on the session. And the nominating committee has come forward with a slate um, but um, those are some things, we have four things we have to accomplish. So I think we can get it done, um, but I, we'll need your support. So hopefully you'll stay, and I know that we have some nice food in the back um, that will be encouraging us to uh, move quickly through the meeting and go back and have some fellowship and eat together. Um, today, again, starts our Lenten season, and I'm hoping that you are using your Lenten devotional already that was emailed to you. If you are not one that can use one off of the internet, um, there are a couple hard copies left uh, in the back. If you need more, let me know and I can print some for you. They're very, very good devotionals. Um, I will call your attention to um, the other announcements. Um, the Eclipse event needs some helpers, and I know that they're um, you can talk with Gail Batman. Um, that will be help happening on April the 8th, um, and we will need helpers all day long um, as we will be offering our parking lot um, up as a fundraiser for the Blessings Home Orphanage. Um, and you can uh, have many different places that you can help out. And then, um, Jeff, do you want to talk any further about the CPR class, or would you like me to... Thank you. 
always good to have a bunch of people trained in this, especially for people like me. You know? Help me out when I get old and everything else like that. So, uh, please think about it. It's, I guess, not the most pleasant way to spend a Saturday learning about CPR, but uh, it'll help us out as a church. So, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Read more about it here in your announcements, CPR first aid class on March the 9th, and also the same class offered on March the 10th. A cost right now is $65, but if we get our attendance up above 10, there'll be discounts and there are scholarships offered. All right. Um, many thanks for those who helped, um, and particular thanks to our Boy Scouts that helped um, with the pancake supper and the Ash Wednesday service last week. Uh, any other announcements from the congregation? All right, then. Let us prepare to worship the Lord our God. Find some silence in your minds and your hearts, and we will listen to the prelude as the wind song. Good morning. Please join with me in the call to worship. People of the covenant, God does not remember us according to our sins and transgressions. God remembers us according to God's own steadfast love. The God of our salvation teaches us right paths and leads us in truth. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. We put our trust in God. Let us worship the Lord our God. Please stand if you are able and let us sing, Brethren, we have met to worship.
God remains faithful to the covenant of steadfast love, even when we are unfaithful. Without fear, then, let us confess our sins. God of mercy, we begin this Lenten season in confession. We do not live according to your ways, but according to our own. We condone violence, participate in systems of injustice, and use power to our own advantage at the expense of others. Forgive us, we pray, when we are tempted to follow paths other than those you set before us. Teach us your commandments, help us to turn from evil, and turn us toward your kingdom drawing near. In covenantal love, remember us and be for us an ark of safety and new life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, forgives us and reconciles us and all things in heaven and on earth. In him we are forgiven. Thanks be, Thanks to, be God. to God. Amen. Amen. Christ be with you. And also with you. Having been forgiven, let us share our peace with one another. Please share a sign of greeting and forgiveness with one another using our heart hands, which I'm not so good at, but I know you all are. <laughs> and say, the peace of Christ be with you.
wonderful. How are you doing? Good. Doing good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Well, today is um, the beginning of a new season in the church. We talk about seasons, talk about winter, spring, summer, and fall, but the church has some seasons too. And today is the beginning of a new season. Well, actually, tell you the truth. Last Wednesday was the beginning of the season, but this is the first Sunday in that season. It's called Lent. Can you say that? Lent? Lent. You don't want to say Lent. 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 Lent is what you find in your pockets, right? Down on the bottom of your pocket. Lent. Lent. Okay. Lent is a time, and you can see things look a little different in here too. There's lots of purple. I'm wearing purple uh, stole, and up, up there there's purple pyramid, and there's purple uh, table of cloth underneath the flowers. There's purple, and you have a purple coat. You're dressed in lint coat, colors, yep. That's right, there's purple. All right, so we're reminded of the season by just sort of how the church is taking on different, different uh, symbols in the church. But um, during the season of Lent, what, what we want to do is it lasts for 40 days, and at the end of Lent is Easter, all right? And so during this time, we're preparing ourselves for Jesus' coming, just like we were preparing during Advent for Jesus' coming when he was born, we're preparing ourselves for his coming from the grave, all right, from his re- for his resurrection on Easter morning. And the way we prepare ourselves during Lent is we get sort of thoughtful. We, we, we look inside of ourselves. And if our, our, we're not real clean and ready for Jesus, we get ourselves that way. Instead of, instead of having minds that maybe are thinking bad thoughts or actions that are not really right in Jesus' way. We ask for direction and we ask for forgiveness and we get ourselves all ready for the new kind of life that Jesus brings us when he rises from the grave and we realize that believing in him is a whole new way of living, right? Right? You understand what I'm saying? So Lent is a time when we do a lot of praying, and we do, sometimes we give things up so that we really are focused on, on what, we, what we need to be thinking about, looking inside ourselves. We do a lot of Bible study. We think hard about the scripture and what it teaches us. And we do helping others. We give outside of ourselves. We try to try to look at, look at the world and how we need to be caring for those that are homeless and maybe don't have enough food or enough clothing or maybe are um, struggling somehow. We try to help others. And there's also something else we do during Lent. And I have them here. Do you guys remember that at Easter time, we gave you these, I call them Alleluia sticks. Do you remember these? Right? We, we wave these at Easter time, and it reminds us that we can at Easter time say, Alleluia, and we praise the Lord that Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, during the time of Lent, we put our Alleluias away. We don't say Alleluia during the 40 days prior to Easter during Lent. And that isn't because we don't want to praise the Lord, it's because we want to save them. So that when we say, say it on Easter morning, we can say it loud and excitedly, and we can really, really praise the Lord with our hallelujahs. All right? So for a long, long time, for lots, lots, lots of years, the church has had the tradition of not saying hallelujah during Lent. So what we're going to do is I've got all these, all these hallelujahs in here, these hallelujah sticks, and they remind us that we will do this during Easter, all of these alleluia sticks. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to put them away. You're going to see me just put them right here. They're going in a basket. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this basket right here under the table. 
and we're going to keep them right there during Lent. We've put our alleluias away, and we won't say alleluia until Easter morning, and then we're going to say it, sing it, dance it, and sway our alleluia sticks and say it with great gusto, okay? All right. All right. All right. All right. So during Lent, let's see if we can do all of those things that we talked about, okay? You think you can? I think so. Let's make Lent a really good season this year for us, looking inside ourselves and helping other people and reading the scripture and trying to get prepared for Jesus to come. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, help us to journey with you to, um, through Holy Week and, and to the, um, the empty tomb on Easter morning and help us to do that well this year. I ask you to be with these children and be my, help them to be mindful of you and to be um, really, even at their young age, be very um, um, prayerful and walk with you closely. We say this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Boys and girls, thank you for listening. You are dismissed, and you may go to Children's Chapel with Miss Josephine if you are seven or under. Thank you. And I will call the choir forward.
Listen to the prayer for illumination. O Lord, may the words of your mouth be our daily bread, and may the leading of your spirit become our way. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen now for God's word from Psalm 25. This is a responsive reading. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Mark. The second reading today comes from Genesis. We'll be reading from the ninth chapter of Genesis, verses 8 through 17. Listen now for God's word to you. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow that is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bowl is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Wondrous Savior, uphold me now as we uplift you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, even though there is a great deal of biblical illiteracy out there, most people, most people have heard the Bible story of Noah's Ark. If not in Sunday school, they've picked it up since they were children from the decorations of their bedrooms or the toys or the clothing that was marketed to them or the preschool songs that they learned to sing. And then there's every so often a report that they probably heard of some archaeologist who thinks they've found a piece of the ark And, of course, there's those corny jokes that bring the story to light. Jokes musing how the unicorns must have missed the boat, or how the ark somehow survived the termites, or why didn't Noah take the chance when he had it 
to get rid of cockroaches. Yes, most people have heard the story of Noah's Ark. But as you might imagine, the scriptural story of Noah is actually very different than what most know. In fact, the flood account is actually not a children's story at all. It is pretty terrifying. It was, in fact, again, as you might already know, likely claimed as Jewish scripture from a common religious tradition of flood accounts written in the ancient, ancient Near East literature. It was first written down, written down, when God's people were in a situation of tremendous loss, stress, and helplessness, probably at the time of the exile around 6th century BCE. The Babylonians had defeated their army, had leveled Jerusalem, and carried them off into captivity, into exile, a time when everything that was known to them that was stable and reliable was no more. The people felt abandoned, they felt alone, they felt without hope. They must have felt that they were experiencing some kind of chaos, just like the chaos of a Noah's mighty flood, sweeping away everything that was purposeful and beautiful and precious. However, as the Genesis story that was written down for them started to unfold, it gave them something more than just something to identify with. It gave them encouragement. It gave them comfort. And it gave them hope. It ultimately affirmed for them the character of their living, sovereign, very unique God. You recall, the story begins with the people who populated the earth being wicked, murderous, and violent. They had no regard for the value of life, no regard for goodness or order at all. Their crimes could be traced back to the disobedience of Adam and Eve, to the murder of Abel by Cain, and the perversion of Cain's descendant Lamech and Lamech's people. Creation had turned its back on its creator. As Walter Brueggemann says, creation had exchanged the truth about God for a lie, worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. And the creator God, as all ancient Near East deities are, was angry and of the mind to smash everything to bits, in this case to flood the whole project. Divine justice demanding punishment. It is the oldest idea people had of God, an angry judge punishing recalcitrant and disobedient people. It is the oldest presentation of how ancient people saw religion. However, however, then the Genesis story departs from the old ancient Near East type narrative. The author's perspective of their, of our God, takes a turn from that of the pagan gods. God was shown to detest sin of the people not because God is an angry tyrant, but because the people were behaving contrary to all that God is, holy, just, pure, righteous, beyond compare. The people were not behaving as God created them to be and not in the way that God deeply desired for them. 
Additionally, God was shown to not be distant and immovable, but vulnerable and free, free to enter into his creation, into its pain, into its brokenness as well as its joys and successes. Consequently, the God of Israel could be compassionate and have a change of heart, even if it was a broken heart. The God of Israel could choose to exercise restraint and divine mercy and could rescue that which should otherwise be condemned. In the biblical story, then, we see that God, our God, chose to not destroy the entire world, but to spare righteous Noah, his family, and two of every species of creature. This revelation of God's character was affirmed further when God made a promise, a covenant, that never again will God destroy creation. As a sign of the covenant, God set a rainbow, a bow that was pointing away from the earth in the clouds, not just to jog, jog Noah's memory, but to jog God's. Note that it was a covenant without strings attached. It was not conditional, if-then kind of promise. There was no expectation that creation would change, but yet the covenant was made. And sure enough, it was not long before Jacob was stealing Esau's birthright, Aaron was dancing around a golden calf, and David was figuring out how to kill Bathsheba's husband. In fact, it was not too long, too long, before people were irrevocably polluting the planet, developing nuclear bombs, committing horrible cyber crimes, pulling off Ponzi schemes, and shooting children in churches and celebratory parades. Evil continues. Bad things happen. But since Genesis 9, we know that none of them is rooted in God's ill will towards us. With this covenant, God, our God, has pledged that God will stay with us, will endure our burdens, and sustain the world despite our sorry state. Barbara Brown Taylor says it this way, From this point on, God is bringing God's self to the creation in peace, promising himself to it, although he knows how it will wound him. God chooses to ally himself with his cantankerous creation, whatever the cost. If there is to be pain in the world, our God will share it. God's promise to the world is life, not death. So friends, the Noah story is much more than the story we learned as children, or that we might be teaching our own children. It is the story which introduces the truth, which is then threaded throughout all the rest of Holy Scripture, throughout all the rest of Holy Scripture. And it is at the heart of the New Testament, of the Gospel. It's the truth about our God, who, at the cost to God himself, makes a committed commitment to the flesh. Exodus 6, 6 through 7, I will deliver you from your bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. Isaiah 43, 1 to 2, I have redeemed you. When you pass through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Jeremiah 31, 33, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 
and John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. Right. So, how does this translate for us in our lives today? What does it mean for you and me today? Well, does it not mean that we can get up each day and face the world a little differently? For no matter what bad happens, and bad happens, we can count on God to help us through. For, for instance, when, when we sin and fall short of what we were created to be, and we do that, we can still go on without the weight of guilt and shame just paralyzing us. We can walk forward forgiven, repentant, not fearing eternal punishment. For God wants for us life and not death. God is committed to this. God has been from the very beginning committed to the flesh. And the fact This fact frees us to then do more with our lives than just protect them. We are free because of this to offer them. We are free to offer our lives for the world. We are free to be the people that God created us to be. Yes, brothers and sisters, the noetic covenant means this for us. God will never abandon creation. God will never abandon us. The next time that it rains and the sun sneaks up behind those rain droplets, remember this. Search the sky for God's rainbow and remember, remember that we are children of the God who is committed to the flesh. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us join in singing the congregational response. Take, O take me as I am.
Wondrous God, we give you thanks and praise for the free and abundant gift of grace that you have given us in Jesus Christ. Let the simple gifts of our lives and these offerings be a sign of our unending gratitude for your undying love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, would you join with me in the prayers of the people? Eternal God, you are the power behind all things, behind the energy of the storm, behind the heat of a million suns. You are the power behind the cross of Christ, behind unconquerable love. Your love compels us to speak truth and come to you in prayer. We pray for your church in the world, and we pray for the world. We lift to you those who are afflicted by powers that are beyond their control, who are grieving and afraid, and who are vulnerable to now even further loss. We especially lift the children, the hungry, the poor, the sick, the dying. We pray for that the leaders of the world hear your people cry and simply hear your voice. Let them bring to their people your peace and your tender compassion. Lord, during this Lenten season, as we repent and turn to the gospel, we find ourselves also once again turning to you with tired souls and breaking hearts. Our world is hurting with storms and wars and earthquakes. This morning we ask that you take our tears and turn our grief into action. Help us remember that we are connected to each other that we are in this together. Guide us as we lean into each other and join together to put things back together again. In addition to this fervent prayer, we also lift to you those that are on our hearts who struggle in body and mind and circumstance. We lift to you those that are on our prayer list this morning. We also give you thanks for our many blessings. We thank you for those celebrating special days this week, for birthdays and anniversaries. We thank you for BJ and comfort. We ask you to surround them with the warmth of your presence and remind them how special they are to us, but also to you. And let them not only have special celebratory days, but let their year ahead be filled with blessings. We also thank you for new births. We thank you for Camilla, daughter of Tristan Carnell and great-granddaughter of Louise Wetley. We ask you to be with that family and guide them and help them guide her and direct her into your path of living and let them just feel your joy. We thank you for our servicemen and women and ask that you keep them safe. 
joined together in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all majesty and honor are yours, Holy One, forever and ever. We pray now the prayer our Savior, our light and our life taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's stand, and let's sing the hymn of the church, Be Thou My Vision. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.